So this is a, a Sanskrit translation of uh, a, heavy, a 1968 or 1969 heavy metal band called Black Sabbath. Uh, the song is called Iron Man and I translated into Sanskrit as Loha Purusha. In 2020, during the pandemic, I wrote a book on the science of Indian cooking. Other than that, obviously columns uh, and then uh, blogs for many years, internet memes for many years, uh, more music. Uh, and and obviously uh, Instagram reels focusing on you know food misinformation. I head the digital workplace unit at TCS, uh, so that's my day job, right? So I'm a software engineer, electronic engineer, became a software engineer, and do all of these other things. So obviously, I think uh, the interesting question to ask is how do I find the time? Okay, um, and uh, the reason I sort of structured my talk around this is to fundamentally say that there is a there is this growing intersection between being what I call a strategically lazy engineer and a creative and a good designer. When I was seven years old, my, uh, my father bought me a Rubik's Cube. And one day my parents came back home and I gave them the Rubik's Cube fully sought. My father immediately was like, okay, this, is, this, this guy is IIT material. Eventually he realized, okay, how did you actually solve it? I said, I changed the stickers around. Children will creatively find ways to get what they want. Right? Because they infer the spirit of things. It is also what makes them innately, naturally creative. Uh, but when adults infer rules, it's a very different thing. Meaning, when you in, but as an adult, if you're able to infer the spirit of things, you're a creative person. As an adult, if you infer the rules, you're a criminal. Right? So it's a very blur, bl blurry line between a creative person uh, and a criminal, if you will. But but again, this is this is quite interesting because software is at the center of all of this. Right? Because software is that transition between the purely world of hardware into the purely abstract world of thinking and ideas and so on. And it's a language that allows you to translate ideas into reality far quicker than you can. Engineers are computational thinkers. How do you reduce problems down to small easily solvable, mathematically modelable parts. There's a way to think about, marry both of these and talk about what we call computational creativity. Is the ability for engineers or designers to either use design or technology in the other way around uh, in ways that allow them to be creative quicker, faster, cheaper and iterate more. And the fact that you can iterate more, you can fail fast, you can build more things allows you to be more creative, right? So there is obviously that idea of handcrafting it, getting it perfect. But all of that comes from a backbone of simply just being insanely productive. So here's a classic example, right? Uh, Michelangelo is said to have been asked, how, how did he create this sculpture? Well, I look at a slab of marble, I remove all the bits of the marble that are not David, and then I'm left with David. Right? So this is again, you know, you could say it's arrogance, but the artists among you will realize that it's also how many art, great artists think. It's the negative space, right? A Vincent van Gogh painting is not in the details of the lines that he draws, but what he chooses not to draw, right? So the negative space thinking is very, very important. And it's a muscle that you can actually build because it's tremendously useful to be, to be thinking in negative spaces. And engineers often do not do that. If I wanted to sculpt the David today, I don't have his skills. What can I do? I can go to YouTube and find a way to do this with Lego. Creativity first and foremost, just like engineering problems require you to break it down into smaller modules, creativity also needs Lego bricks that you can build on, right? And these Lego bricks vary by the kind of creativity. Is it musical? Is it UI design? The tools themselves will keep getting better and better, right? What used to be hand-drawn stuff then became Photoshop, then became Figma, is now, you know, conversational UI design, you know, with some of these ChatGPT and DALI and Midjourney and these kind of tools. When you think about how modern day music is made, I'm now actually able to do 25 different takes of that, fail at 24 of them, or maybe say, oh, this one note in this one take came out right. I can use the all powerful God Almighty tool of copy paste to then exactly stitch these things together to ultimately make music that you would not recognize as being played by an amateur. We live in a world today where you will only be limited by the range of your imagination. 
I made a chutney recipe generator and I actually used you know Google Google Sheets for this. Uh, so a chutney essentially has cooked ingredients, raw ingredients, nutty stuff, herbs, salt. So this is sort of like the meta model of how a chutney works. And then obviously there's a, a, a randomizer that just picks ingredients or you could just look at it and say, yeah, I have these things in the fridge so I can make this chutney. Right? Um, and, and again, so the interesting thing is that you could, use, you could do these with, you don't even need to actually have programming skills. Right? So this is stuff that was done with Google Sheets. Uh, and again, for people who are, don't like looking at Excel sheets, uh, I ended up drawing this as well. Uh, I looked at a bunch of inspirations and I drew them on pencil. Then I used a black sketch pen to outline them. Then I scanned them and I used Adobe Illustrator's sort of AI based tracing to smoothen all these edges and make them look a lot better than I actually drew them. And then I colored them in using Photoshop and Illustrator and then combined a bunch of them uh, to actually make this illustration, right? And I, again, by the way, I do not have any actual painting drawing skills, right? So, so this is something, so the point here is that there's a, there's a sense of sort of trying to think of the world in terms of these meta problems and then applying using these tools of creativity to find new ways of solving the same problems. An actual AI based chutney generator. So what, what, what it'll actually do is that I've crawled the internet for about 200,000 recipes, which already exist on Tarla, Dalal, you name it, all the cooking websites, right? Um, download all of them uh, and then generate ingredient pairs with weights, meaning that I'm going to see how, in how many dishes does groundnut and sesame occur together? In how many dishes does jeera and coriander occur together, right? And sort of create weights to say that these two ingredients tend to go together more often than not, right? And after that, encode my grandmother's rules, rules of thumb saying that you shouldn't have more than two nutty ingredients, you shouldn't have more than three vegetables, you shouldn't have more than one garnish and, and so on. Those kinds of broad rules uh, and then essentially enable user preferences. Say, give me a simple chutney, give me a complex chutney, give me a Bengali chutney. Right? Give me a Maharashtrian chutney uh, and then, well, you'll get a chutney. This is a dal recipe generator. Again, this comes from, again, viewing the world as a series of meta models, right? Meaning that a sambar is a dal, a Gujarati dal is a dal, there are Maharashtrian dal, there are Bengali dals. They might use different legumes. Chana is a dal, Rajma is a dal, right? right? So in much the same way that Pongal is a kichdi, kichdi is a kichdi, right? Or Pulusheri is a yogurt gravy and so on. So you can sort of see that Indian cooking is all about different dish templates and then your ability to actually mix and match and so on. So this is a dal recipe generator. This is a salad recipe generator and so on, right? And this is a series of instructions for how to make uh, the perfect egg and this is instructions for how to make perfect coffee and this is for how to make the perfect Manchurian or stir fried, you know, noodles and fried rice, uh, a five step algorithm to do that. So in a sense, my point is that what I have found is that when you create in your mind these Lego blocks for creativity and learn to use some of these other tools, you kind of realize that the way you mix and match them, they actually scale across disciplines and across industries, right? Engineering, in a sense, science, in a sense, at the level of a calculus, at the level of linear algebra, at the level of these things, is a common set of tools that you apply regardless of industry, right? The domain knowledge comes at, the, at a higher level of complexity. But what is fascinating is that what I find is that as you kind of go up, you would assume that something like design and creativity is at this level, the meta skill of applying these creative Lego blocks seems to work across industries. You know, here's an example of how you can think of food in terms of algorithms, right? You can sort of, how this is how a restaurant works, by the way. They have six or seven different gravies, Right? Your paneer Nawabi, paneer Kolapuri, paneer Hyderabadi, paneer Jaipuri. Right? You can have, you can, you, with five or six gravies, bases, you can create like 20 dishes. That's how restaurants do it, right? And different spice mixes uh, and so on, right? And what is interesting is that a lot of interesting creativity now will actually happen at the intersection of many of these things. I'll give you an example, right? How many of you know that uh, our brain associates certain colors with certain flavors. And in fact, we are actually wired. So anything green will taste bitter. Anything red will taste sweet. And anything yellow will taste sour because we have, we have very strong associations evolutionarily with those colors, right? Now, one of the ways you can use this to hack your eating behaviors is that if you're someone looking to reduce your sugar consumption, change your tea cup to red color. You can get away by adding less sugar because your brain will auto-complete and say, this is red mug, it must be sweet, 
and so you can actually get away and you'll have a same perception of sweet. Here's another fascinating thing. All of us, how many of you like airplane food? Nobody likes airplane food because the problem is it's not the food. The problem is that it's engine noise. White noise and the pressure as well as the low humidity in an aircraft makes your taste buds not work. And if you don't hear the sound of you chewing and biting crispy food, your brain will not declare that this is tasty food. So you want to enjoy airplane food, get a noise cancelling earphone and wear it when you're actually eating. Trust me, you'll see a big difference. Right? So that's why in business class, they give you noise cancelling earphones. The younger amongst you will all know Cadbury's dairy milk. What is the shape of Cadbury's dairy milk? Right? So it's, it's rectangle, but the individual pieces are rounded at the top. Right? They're rounded at the top. They were not rounded at the top in the past. Those of the older of you will know that they were actually straight edges at some point of time in the past. And do you know why they became rounded? They get to keep the same size but use less chocolate. A few grams less chocolate because rounded shapes, less volume, simple mathematics, it's simple geometry, right? And what did the public react to? They said, what have you done with the recipe? This chocolate is now way too sweet. So public outcry, huge public outcry, the CEO had to come out and clarify and say, no, we have not changed the recipe. All we've done is change the shape. And then a bunch of actually gastrophysics researchers essentially found out that rounded shapes are more closely associated with sweetness and angular shapes are associated with less sweetness. So if you make a sweet more angular, it will taste less sweet, right? Which is why we all enjoy Kaju Katli thinking, oh, it's not too sweet. It actually is very sweet, but it's just angular. But if the kaju cutli was nice and rounded like a laddu, it'll actually taste much sweeter. Most creativity ultimately is craft masquerading as art. One of our biggest cognitive breakthroughs was our ability to invent language, which sort of put it as a put us at a massive advantage over chimpanzees and gorillas and every other, you know, primate species, animal species, if you will, right? Because language allows us to communicate ideas across a large number of people very efficiently. But as engineers, you will appreciate that language is linear. It's linearly bound. You can only speak at a certain rate, right? You can't speak any faster. People won't understand, right? And then the next big cognitive breakthrough was, well, I can transmit information faster if I commit this to writing. So writing is the next big thing that we did. So we committed natural language to writing. Writing came much after oral language, right? What's the next big cognitive breakthrough is computer and information systems, you know, Claude Shannon and all the rest of it. The key difference between human beings and how computers share knowledge is that our bandwidth to share is limited. Computers have potentially infinite bandwidth. When we invented computing, we said, unfortunately, computers can't speak natural language, so now you have to learn assembly language. Then they said, okay, fine, we'll make it Java. Then they said, we'll make it you know, Python and so on. Uh, we're at that inflection point where the new language with which you will be speaking to computers is natural language again. Except it might be slightly limiting in the near term, but in a way, it's a tremendous democratization for creativity. You need to learn prompt engineering, right? Uh, it is just natural language, but it's also a very interestingly structured way of describing things. In fact, some of the best ways to get the best outputs for many of these AIs is to actually think like an engineer. So in that sense, you guys are at a phenomenal position of being people who are at the intersection of engineering and design, and now, you can speak in natural language to these systems and increase the number of things that you can actually create. On that note, thank you.